You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Print the t-shirts, Ed. A direct quote from the fearless manager of the Chicago White Sox. Quote, uneventful day, we just got our ass kicked. Put that shirt together right now. Knit that, crochet it. Put it on one of those framed things that used to hang in my grandmother's hallway. Uneventful day, we just got our ass kicked. White Sox Baseball 2024. That needs to be a a stained glass window (laughs) on the facade (laughs) of the ballpark. You know, it's better at the ballpark, so let's let's start putting these quotes up there. Yeah. Where people can admire them in all their splendor and beauty. And, and you know, what, what says Major League Baseball better than we have many fine tapestries of all of these things? So I'm I'm all for that. I, I'm I'm all for adding Pedro quotes to to the walls to memorialize them in perpetuity because it just will remind us of this era of White Sox baseball when Some of the things that come out of the manager's mouth just make you wonder what plane of existence he came from and whence he should go back to it. I I know. It's amazing. And that's what I want to focus on more today than getting into the John Schriffen 670, the score, and now ESPN 1000 thing. I told you, this is a big club, these, uh, these Chicago radio guys. Notice how the two competitors came together to go after the new guy. Oh, okay. the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right, exactly. And listen, the new guy ain't that great. He's got a lot to work on. He's not even really a baseball announcer. But no. just notice how the shark circled the guy. I'm not going to get into it anymore because it's just, to me, it's comical that giant radio stations can take the time to pick on him and he throws in one throwaway jab at them. And it's what? 48 hours, 72 hours, just madness all across. How dare he say something about these radio guys? I think I thought it was hysterical. You got a microphone, use it however you want to. I would have done it better. I would have done it better than Shriffin. Oh, yeah, your, your, your insults are usually much more explicit and if you, creative. If you're going to do it, go for it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Don't yeah, throw don't in the radio back. losers thing. Just go for it. Spend an inning going after them dive in on him if you're going to do it. Like, I have no problem with him shooting back. Somebody fires at you publicly, fire back. Every time I fire at somebody, I wait for the response. I think some people are a little afraid to make it. So, Kendrick Lamar, if you're listening, Chris has beef with you. <laughs> if you if you get fired upon and you got a mic, fire back. I got no problem with it. I just would have done it, you know, a little bit differently than him. But l- let's focus on another Pedro quote. And Another this, reason for John to come on the show so we can help him out with that. Uh, he'll never come on our show because he works. He works for the. He works I, for the I, corporation. I, I understand. We get, but, like, and that's the thing. It's not like I'm like flat out defending him, right? Like he's got some things he's got to work on. When you're trailing by seven or eight runs and you lose your mind over one single defensive play, eh, I don't know. I mean, I, I get the enthusiasm that's what you're paid to do. Like right. He's, he's the perfect guy. John Schriffen's the perfect guy for what the White Sox wanted. They want a guy. Live or die, right or wrong, no matter if it's based in fact, is always on the side of the team. Uh, uh, you know, that, that was not something they got from Benetti all the time. And it wasn't even something they always got from Hawk. Hawk would bitch from time to time. I don't know oh, if Josh yeah. Griffin will yeah, ever I, bitch. Like, he is 100% a company guy. And so, and, and you know what? That, that's how the team operates. And I again, I don't want to get into this stuff with him, but like, like that's how I kind of view it. It's madness for people to all debate something that to me seems very normal. Somebody jabbed at somebody, somebody jabs back. It's going to be entertaining. It's more entertaining than the team. Let's be honest. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, how many times can you watch Andrew Benintendi at bat? Or, oh, yeah, that's the quote I want to get Andrew into. Vaughn, or Andrew Vaughn. That's the quote. That's the quote I want to get into. So, Pedro, can we just de-Andrew the team right now? Pedro is talking to... The, the press pool. And uh, Daryl Van Scown from, uh, from the Sun-Times has this tweet that went out on Monday. And here it is. Graffole on Dominic Fletcher, who hasn't had an at-bat since his return. Quote, this is Pedro. Gavin is hitting third, Pham is hitting first, and Benny is a consistent pillar in our lineup. He'll come in for defense, he's talking about Fletcher, and do some stuff. He has to wait for an opportunity and take advantage of it. Now, that may be, and, and, and I know that this is a 
This is a crazy statement because there have been so many bad takes from the manager of the Chicago White Sox since he's been here. That may be the dumbest thing that Pedro Grafal has ever said aloud. Well, that's that's getting to be a really hard statement to make. <laughs> <laughs> I would at least say that's the dumbest thing Pedro Grafol has said so far. Okay. Okay. Because here's, first of all, on the surface of it, the, the dumb thing that's right there for you to see is Benny is a consistent pillar in our lineup. That's, that's the one, right? Right there. Andrew Benintendi, I, look, we've defended the signing before. He is a competent major league outfielder. Was. This is, this is not his season, and maybe there's a problem with him. Maybe it's a physical problem. Maybe it's a mental problem. Maybe he's just done as a major league ball player, but he's hitting 190 with an OPS under 500. That's unacceptable on any level. And a negative 1.7 B war, I think, was the last time I I looked. Right. I mean, the guy, he's striking out way more than he normally would. He's not walking to save, you know, anything. He somehow is muscled up for three home runs, which kind of beats what he did last year, but this is not a guy right now that needs to be a pillar of anything other than maybe on the end of the bench, you know, as a pillar, he can sit, he can stand at the end of the bench as an actual pillar. That's, that's probably his use right now, because according to the wins above replacement metric, he's cost you two games. Uh, You know, there's a lot of games you've lost, but he's at least two of them. And, And that is maybe the most absurd statement ever made, especially when you look at a guy that all white Sox fans know as an MVP and a real pillar that used to be in the middle of our lineup in Jose Abreu, who voluntarily went down to the minors to work on his problem because he knew he wasn't good enough. And guess what? He's actually performing better on the season than Andrew Benintendi. So the the idea that you have to put Benny into the lineup, there's no good reason except for the fact you're paying him $75 million over five years. That's what this is. You're paying him $75 million over five years. For the White Sox, that's a huge amount of money. Not for the rest of Major League Baseball. But for the White Sox, that's a huge amount of money. And you don't want to take him out of the order. The other problem, though, in the quote is the idea that because Gavin Sheets is playing right field and hitting third, there's no room for any other outfielder to get in there. And I would counter with, he shouldn't be in right field. Because Andrew Vaughn also sucks just as hard as Andrew Benintendi. Andrew Vaughn also is being force-fed into the top half of your lineup by the manager each and every day. He's also hitting under 200. He also is, I mean, statistically, you could just put them next to each other, the two Andrews. They're awful. And the manager continues to play the two of them and not only play them, but play them over other players possibly, well, definitely more deserving of a chance and continue to play them up towards the top of the order, which is costing you runs and games at this point. Andrew Vaughn should not automatically be an everyday top half of the order first baseman for this team. Memorial Day is coming up this week. This is what he is this year. He's got well over 1,500 major league at-bats. It's a joke to think that all of a sudden he's going to become a mainstay in the middle of your order. He never was good enough to be a mainstay in the middle of your order up until this season, and he's definitely not good enough to be it now. But what you're saying is you won't give the opportunity to a guy who's got a better long-term chance of being something in your outfield and getting some opportunity because Andrew Vaughn has to play first, so Gavin Sheets has to be out of position in right field, and Andrew Benintendi has to be in the lineup every day. It's absurd. Socks in the Basement listeners, switch to a new age of life. Keep mom and dad, grandma and grandpa out of assisted living. Make it so they can get around on their own and live independently. With stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, and even bathroom remodeling, you need to go to Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. They're going to work with insurance and have 0% financing for qualified individuals. Hyatt Home Medical Equipment also has the latest and greatest in CPAP machines. Unhappy with your vendor, switch and get supplies directly mailed to you. Plus, test it all out at their big, beautiful showroom on the south side. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors. Learn all about Hyatt Home Medical Equipment at HHME.com. Well, and let's not forget the whole idea going into this season was Chris Getz wanted to put the best defensive team out there that he could. 
Andrew Benintendi was never known as a glove first outfielder. In fact, he's mediocre at best as an outfielder. Gavin Sheets is just bad. It's not, it's not, you said it perfectly. He's, he's again, he's playing out of position. This team has been playing Gavin Sheets out of position. And honestly, I don't fault Gavin Sheets because if I'm given an opportunity to get into a major league lineup and I have to play right field, even though I'm not really a good outfielder and it's not what I've grown up doing and it's not something that I'm really going to excel at, I'm sure Gavin Sheets tries really hard. And, and I'm glad Gavin Sheets is showing something this year. I'm glad he has worked his way into the lineup. He was a guy that I had written off in spring training. But honestly, if you want to improve this team's fortunes, a guy like Gavin Sheets who drops balls that hit him in the glove needs to get out of right field and be your first baseman or work into the DH role a little bit and, and, and even you know give Aloy some, some breathers on the bench. You also need to really address what Andrew Benintendi is and whether or not he's got anything going forward that's going to help this team or help another team. If you're hoping he's going to hit his way out of this, I don't think it's going to happen. If you're hoping he's going to suddenly become a really good fielder after his entire major league and minor league career, I don't think it's going to happen. So why is it that we are being force-fed these guys? And what is it? I understand the Benintendi contract thing. The Andrew Vaughn thing continues to mystify me because for years, this guy just has not had it. He has not shown that he is worthy of his draft status. He has not shown that he has put it together. And this year he is just bad and it's getting worse. And honestly, if you want to fix Andrew Vaughn, he needs a change of scenery. Triple A. Send him the send him the triple A where the where the right where the where the ball flies out of a bandbox and he can get some it's get some some confidence. Why can't you send this guy with all these options down to the minors to work out his stuff. What is the problem? Is it because of the marketing department? Because they put him on too many things? Is it because he's the great white hope that you need to have as part of your as part of your presentation to the fan base? What is it about Andrew Vaughn? And you have a guy in sheets that could stand at first base. It's not like you're getting rid of him for no good reason. You're getting rid of him to make opportunity for guys that are willing to play and can give you a better contribution. Like, I, look, you're paying Andrew Benatini a ton of money. I'd be sitting him. I would start telling him you don't have a guaranteed spot in the field. You have to start showing me something. And when you bat, you bat in the six, seven, eight, or nine spot. And that's what I would be doing at this point with him. I think Isaac Ian would be doing it as well. I think any manager across Major League Baseball, honestly, would be doing that, with the exception of here, because... This is the richest contract in White Sox history, which is a joke of a, a statistic. It is the stupidest statistic ever because it is just it, Andrew Benintendi would have signed that exact contract with every other major league team that wanted to sign him. It, it, it's not even a question of that. And he would be he would have been benched weeks ago by pretty much every other manager. Tell me one other manager that doesn't have him sitting as a pillar on the bench. Let's look at their box score on Monday. This illustrates the point perfectly. Pedro marches Pham, Vaughn, Sheets, Jimenez, and Benintendi out as the top five guys. They score a total of three runs. All of the runs are driven in by the guys that you have to put behind these guys because those are my top players. I've got to play them up there. So Paul DeYoung and Corey Lee combine to go four for seven with three runs batted in. They have to, with multiple outs already up there, one or two outs, and most of the time it was with two outs, get the big hit to dig everybody out because Ben Benintendi right before it gets to the young was 0 for 4, and Vaughn in the two spot was 0 for 4. You are losing baseball games with your decisions. You are giving up runs, and there's no point to losing, folks. Anybody who believes that losing gives you a better draft pick has not realized there's new rules. They can't even draft in the top 10, no matter how bad they finish. So there's no point to losing. So now it's either A, Chris Getz lied to us. He lied when he said he wanted to, to build trust back with the fan base. He lied when he said that defense mattered and how you played the game. And, and he lied about the fact that things were going to change and there was going to be accountability. It's a bold-faced lie because you have no accountability. You don't care about defense. You're not earning anybody's trust back by looking at us, reasonable baseball fans, and lying to our face about what these guys are, okay? So either Chris Getz is a bold-faced liar, meet the new boss, same as the old boss, or Chris Getz 
is hanging this guy out to dry. He's giving him so much rope to hang himself that he's relying on people like us to scream and yell about how he's a bad manager. A guy like Ozzie Guillen, who works for the mothership, can go on and rip the manager as a guy who won a World Series for this team, and nobody's putting the, the mute button on him. And Or if they are, they're lightly hitting it. They're not fully pressing it down. And this is, we need public relations. We need a swell from this fan base that's so angry about the manager that we can go to the old man and say, you got to pay him to sit on his couch, even though you don't want to do it. You miser. So it's it's one or the other. Chris Getz is a bold-faced liar and no different from anybody else that's ever run that team over the last couple of decades. Incompetent even, or He's put out so much rope that Pedro can hang himself and he's going to fire the manager before the season is over. It's one or the other. I I, I can't believe that Chris Getz is that much of a liar because how how is he ever going to get away with a lie, right? I I mean, that's that's the other than the fact that that it's going to take years for Jerry to fire him or or Jerry's death for him to lose his job. But but what's in it for Chris Getz to lie to the fans and then pull this stunt on us, right? It doesn't make any sense. It, it, it seems more like, because you, you see him making trades still. You see him bringing players in. Corey Jolks is here, okay? This is a guy who's never going to break into the Astros lineup. He's got some talent. You know, there, there's some reasons why he should be given an opportunity in the major leagues. And, you know, if he's not playing tonight as we're sitting here looking at the, the, the next matchup, which is Yusei Kikuchi, a lefty, if right-handed hitting Corey Jolks is not in the lineup, what are we doing, right? And and even looking at Andrew Vaughn's history against Yusei Kikuchi, where he's hitting all of 143 against him in seven at-bats, I realize it's a small sample size, but Andrew Vaughn's supposed to crush lefties. He has not crushed this particular lefty. So what are we doing if Andrew Vaughn's hitting towards the top of the lineup against a guy he's had no success with and, and has a little bit of history? I mean, if you're going to rely on veterans – then you have to look to what these veterans have done and you got to be willing to move them around. You got to be willing to make adjustments. That's how major league baseball teams win games. If you want to look at the Tampa Bay Rays, how do they win games without having any high priced talent? Well, it's partially that when they find talent, they try and use it correctly. Okay. They brought up a kid named Johnny DeLuca and he started seven straight games and was hitting great. And then they sat him basically for a week. He had a couple of pinch hit appearances because they had other guys come up and they wanted to work other guys in. And presumably there were matchup issues. So they adjusted. They didn't just throw this guy in and say, okay, here, here's a job. Nor did they bring the hit up and say, okay, here, you're going to only hit in these certain circumstances. They move guys around. They try different things. They get guys in and out, and they, they bring guys up and down. They shuttle them around all the time. Most teams do that. What the White Sox and what Pedro seems to want to do, and assuming Pedro's making these lineups and not Chris Getz, I'm, 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 again, I'm going to sit here and say that the more logical of the two is, is that this manager is overmatched and has no idea how to do this. Right. Well, that's the other thing. What if, if Getz is making the lineup? Oh, my God. Oh well, well, then then Chris gets. Oh, what are we doing here? At, at that point, if he's if he's bringing in the team and he's making the lineup, then he needs to go. Yeah, I mean, like, because this is this is crazy. I mean, like, if it is not Pedro, and it seems like it is, but if it is not Pedro, that's uh, that's like one of those reveals at the end of a movie where you sit there and say, "Well, now I hate this movie. I hate all the characters, and I never want to watch. I uh, never want to watch the big screen again." Like, that's how I, it's like one of those ones that just make you want to vomit afterwards. Like, it would make no sense to me. I, I really honestly believe, it, and just to settle this idea once and for all, I would say that the overwhelming majority of general managers in modern baseball do not, do not make the lineups because they want their managers to have the, the locker room, right? They want their managers to, to not be just, a, a, you know, a cardboard cutout that stands in the dugout and, and is given orders because they know that the it doesn't players won't really respect or, or do anything for a manager that has no power, that is not making the lineups, that has no decision making authority, and can't hold anybody accountable at that point. The fact is Pedro does not hold anybody accountable because he plays favorites. He likes his veterans. He clearly has a problem playing young guys, which is super problematic for a team that is trying to figure out what they have for the years coming up and the years going forward. And one suspects, we talked about Brian Ramos. If Ramos doesn't get hurt, okay, you do wonder what his fate would have been if he hadn't gotten injured 
And would he be rotting on the bench in favor of Zach Remillard? Okay. Zach Remillard, who, by the way, gets picked off against the Yankees because he's watching to see what the, uh, the call is going to be at first base on the check swing appeal and not paying attention to where the ball is on the, on the, on the, on the field. Well, the one thing that did stick out this week is that Pedro said that Ramos is going to get some rehabilitation games and then come back and be put into the lineup. And I would like to see him back in the order at some point before this next homestand is over. We've got this weekend against the Orioles. The Blue Jays then come to us. I know we're playing them right now in Toronto. I want to be having a beer, 33rd in Princeton at Cork and Carry at the Park, the proud sponsors of Socks in the Basement. I want to be having a burger, an award-winning burger off their big menu of burgers and ballpark favorites. I want to be sitting at the extensive bar, the rotation of craft beers, familiar favorites, spirits, and wines. And I want to be getting ready to see Brian Ramos over at third base. By the way, Cork and Carry at the park is your home base for White Sox pregame, postgame, and in-game viewing parties. See more at CorkandCarry.com. But that's what you expect. I want to see him do it because I don't trust him. I, again, I'm going to go back to Ozzy, my pick to take over this team. Just do it. You're going to have more fans in the ballpark, more interest in your team, and you're going to play better. And it's better for you, the development of your players. And it's better for your locker room. Like, this guy's sitting right there. But, like, the best quote, he was he was on top of this in the last week, Guillen was, where he sat there and he, sat, he was asked the question, what would you do with Yohan Moncada when he came back? And he was like, I love Monkey. I like how he calls him Monkey. I love Monkey, and I'm paraphrasing here because I'm trying to remember what he said. I love Monkey, but he would not be playing third base. Ramos plays third base every day. Monkey can go over and play second, and if he don't want to play second, Monkey's my new bench coach. <laughs> there That's you go. the guy who should be managing your team. That's, that guy would have Andrew Benintendi standing at the end as a pillar holding up the dugout. That's what he would be. Yeah, Andrew Benintendi would be tasked with passing out the the, the seeds, right? The <laughs> right? seeds in the big league too. And and again, it, this isn't something where it's like, okay, you know, we do we do point out the the flaws in players on the show, and we we pick on guys. And and I referenced Paul DeYoung a few times about you know a guy that's that's expendable on this team. He's my second baseman if Colson Montgomery gets up here later in but the year. Honestly, yeah, I I love the fact that Paul DeYoung is is reclaiming his career on the South Side of Chicago. That's great. Okay, that's that's what this team was sort of meant to be this year was it was finding a Paul DeYoung to sit there and say, look, I can still hit around 250. I still got power. I can still play the field. I'm still a viable major league player. Sometimes it happens that veterans just fall off for no darn discernible reason. And Andrew Benintendi has been on a slow decline for several years now. And it's, it's been, it's been noticeable. It's been watchable as he bounced from the Red Sox to a couple of different teams before signing with the White Sox. Andrew Benintendi was not the guy he was when he first came up. There's something going on with him, and and it's been a slow burn. And this might be one of those things where, hey, you know, it ends up being a bad contract, which if we weren't suffering under the leadership of an owner who throws nickels around, not even like their manhole covers, he like has to throw them around like it's a big old chunk of the street with the manhole cover welded into place, we wouldn't be having these conversations. But the team would be way more interesting if we're watching Brian Ramos develop. The team right now would be way more interesting if I'm if I'm looking to see if Dominic Fletcher can reclaim the ability to hit the way he showed it as a member of the Arizona Diamondbacks versus me sitting here wondering whether or not Gavin Sheets is going to catch this fly ball to right field because sometimes the ball doesn't stay in his glove. But I've seen him at first base. That doesn't seem to be as much of an issue. I would be much more interested in what Corey Jolks is versus what Andrew Benintendi is no longer. I would be much more interested in, we've talked about Corey Lee and the fact that he's much more interesting to watch behind the plate than Martin Maldonado. One, because Maldonado is on the downslope of his career. We know what he is. We know what he was. But two, Corey Lee is a guy that now I can start to get invested in. And if you want me to come to the ballpark, don't tell me it's better at the ballpark because of a milkshake. I'm lactose intolerant. If I drink that milkshake, <laughs> everybody around me suffers, okay? Don't tell me that. Tell me it's better at the ballpark because I get a chance to watch Corey Lee and Paul DeYoung go back to back, and I get to see the fireworks. That's cool, okay? That's me getting invested in players that I might grow to like, all right? Stop telling me I like Andrew Vaughn. 
I don't. I, I don't might like have liked him. Andrew Vaughn four years ago, but I don't like him now. I don't like him anymore. He's a bust. I want to see Corey Lee a catcher. I want to see uh, Gavin Sheets at first base on a regular basis. I want to see Paul DeYoung in my lineup. And even when Colson Montgomery gets here, I want him in my lineup. When Yoan Moncada comes back, like like Ian said, Monkey can go stand at second base. And then you can figure out what you want to do with him and DeYoung when all of a sudden Colson Montgomery comes up and Ramos is over at third when he gets back here as quickly as humanly possible. I want to see Tommy Pham in my outfield with Luis Robert Jr. showing up within the next couple of weeks to stand out in my outfield as well. And then Andrew Benintendi is going to have to to fight to be out in the outfield along with all of these other players that are capable of standing out there. And guys like Vaughn, a guy like Vaughn should be down in AAA and working out his stuff. And this is stupid that we're sitting here having to say this week in, week out, and they're acting like they don't see it. And they continue to, 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 to push this message around on the baseball fans, on the White Sox fans, that makes me think they think we're all stupid. We're not dumb. We can see what's going on here. You, you, you sat there in the preseason. Your general manager went on every show that the PR department would allow him to go on and said, we're going to earn the trust back. This is the exact opposite of that. Something I want to point out before we get out of here, an interesting stat I want your take on, because I thought this was incredible. I'm always complaining about the, fa- the way that pitchers don't go very deep in White Sox games. Starting pitching for the last couple of years does not go very deep in the games. And I'm still waiting on who's going to take over that other spot in the rotation now that Brad Keller is gone, and it better be Nick Nostrini. The, uh, the Brad Keller experiment did not take very long. A couple of good games out of the bullpen. One really awful start where he's just giving up bomb after bomb after bomb, and everyone's like, well, I guess Brad Keller really is the Brad Keller that we saw in Kansas City. Right, Bye-bye. right. And you know what? And Nick Nostrini should be up, and if he's not going to be up, then you're telling me that Ethan Katz is a detriment to young players, and I don't know why he's the pitching coach. It's either a benefit to get him to the majors to work out what he needs to work out at this point as the fifth starter, or there's another issue altogether. But I, I looked at this stat. Uh, I came across this stat. It's the percentage of total games where that team's starting pitcher had more innings pitched than the opposing starting pitcher. So what it does, it says... How many times, let's say, do the White Sox actually have their starter hanging there longer than the opposing team? The leaders in this, the Yankees, 58.3% of the time, their starter makes it longer than the opposing team. The Mariners, 57.4%. The Pirates, 54.2%. The Cubs are at 43.8% if you want somebody that's local. The Tigers, 43.5%. The White Sox, 25.5%. The second worst in terms of their pitchers, their starting pitchers being able to go into a game longer than the opposing pitcher. That's astounding to me. And Ethan Katz, again, a guy who nobody seems to jump all over and say, what is this guy doing as the pitching coach? Because I want to start questioning him in future shows because I don't get it. That, that's a bad, that's a terrible stat. That's, that's, that's awful. They're not even they're not even going deep in the games. They're getting blown out early on. And some of that might also be because the offense is so bad that other starting pitchers can hang in there longer. Right. I, I was about to say, I mean, <laughs> I mean like, there, there's there's a flip side of that coin of like when it's when it's a bullpen day because you're facing the White Sox offense. Right. But to be that bad, know. to be that down uh, the list, I mean, we're talking about the only team that's worse than them is the A's at twenty two point four percent. and The Marlins are just above them at twenty seven point one. Nostrini needs to come up now. No more of these retreads. No more of these Brad Keller types. Let's start pitching the guys that are part of the future to see whether or not they're really part of the future. He's ready. Okay. I don't know what else he's going to learn down there. We've had plenty of minor league guys come on this show who cover the minors and prospects who will say the triple A Charlotte is a band box and it's very hard to evaluate a pitcher down there because everybody's hitting the ball off of every pitcher that's down there. Drew Thorpe going to Triple A is he's not going to look as good. If he does look as good, he should be up immediately because that that place is not good for starting pitcher statistics and for how and, and and keeping their ERA down and their WHIP down and everything else like that. It is a just a hitter's paradise that league and that stadium. So at some point, he either can pitch in the majors or he can't. Stop messing around and bring the kid up. Bring one of the kids up and let's start seeing him pitch. Yeah, you know, you see Noel Schultz gets promoted. Uh, he's now with, with the Barons. So that's, you know, that's progress there. But you expect that there would be some upward movement then. Yeah. And I w- I'm willing to concede that that a little bit of what, what has plagued the White Sox this year has been guys like Mike Soroka who can't go deep uh, because he's been getting blown out early. And also you've had some, 
less than starters really right now. Only Eric Fetty and I would say Chris Flexen, oddly enough, are guys that you would say would go a little bit deeper because you're monitoring Garrett Crochet a little bit too, right? You're, you're keeping an eye on, on his workload. So there's some of that that goes on, which would explain why they're not leading the league. But it's bad. I mean, that is just a bad statistic because what that says is is one of two things. Either A, your pitchers are really ineffective, B, they're really inefficient, or C, they're just, you know, you are so bad offensively that other teams, like I said, it's, it's like throwing a side session because you don't have to worry about even – You don't even have to worry about throwing strikes. You just have to throw the ball up there and watch the White Sox flail. But I don't think it's really that as much lately and and as much as it was early in the year. You know, I I caught an article from USA Today that said uh, as of a month ago that if you had bet $100 on the White Sox losing every single day, you would have already been up $1,200. And that was through April 22nd. It's changed a little bit. If you want to look at Ethan Katz and you want to look at White Sox pitchers being efficient and White Sox pitchers going deep into games. Look at what's happening with Dylan Cease now that he's with the Padres versus Dylan Cease the past couple of years with the White Sox, where Cease's stuff was never in question. It was his ability to go deep. It was his ability to get beyond the fifth inning. It was his ability to be an ace-like pitcher who takes you through a game as opposed to a guy that just starts a game, okay? Cease getting out to San Diego all of a sudden has the ability to pitch like an ace and, and and be able to take games a little bit further and take games a little bit longer. I don't know if Ethan Katz is not teaching that. I don't know if Ethan Katz is not doing something to help these guys get outs without needing to run up their pitch count. And I don't know if the White Sox pitching philosophy needs to, to be adapted or if they're just simply, this is just a, such a bad crew and such a, a, a mediocre group that when Nick Nostrini does have a bad game, they're giving him an early pull. When Jonathan Cannon has a bad game, they're giving him an early pull because they don't want to ruin these guys. They're they're watching Garrett Crochet. They're not going to let him go deep unless he's being hyper-efficient with his pitches. They're really relying on a guy like Flexen or a guy like Fetty to take them deeper into games on their days, but neither of those guys are necessarily efficient. It's going to come back to Ethan Katz. Can Ethan Katz take these guys to a level where you have a starting rotation that can go six very easily, can get you into the seventh on occasion and hang around so that you don't have to tax your bullpen? Or is there a White Sox philosophical problem? And you're right. I think we probably need to look at this a lot deeper. But in the meantime, in a season of bad stats, that's one that just sits there and makes you go, ugh. Listen, I'll go back to the quote at the beginning of the show. Uneventful day, we just got our ass kicked. I don't care about the getting your ass kicked part, but the uneventful day is an uneventful day because you just keep running out the same lineup, you just keep doing the same thing, you aren't really working to develop for a future, and you're making poor decisions, and that's what makes the day uneventful because you're not actually getting better day in and day out, and that should be your focus. So the ass kick thing, whatever. Uneventful day, that has to stop. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.